So our plot in the diary of Anne Frank is thickening. Um, remember, this is a true story, so it's not just a plot, right? It really happened. So Anne and Peter, their relationship is changing slowly but surely. They're able to have conversations now um, and actually enjoy each other's company. So um, in our next scene, things are going to continue to amp up just like they've been doing. This is our second to last day that we're going to be on Anne Frank. So we're winding towards the end. Here we go. Scene two. It is evening after supper. From outside, we hear the sound of children playing. The grown-ups, with the exception of Mr. Van Damme, are all in the main room. Mrs. Frank is doing some mending. Mrs. Van Damme is reading a fashion magazine. Mr. Frank is going over business accounts. Dussel, in his dentist jacket, is pacing up and down, impatient to get into his bedroom. Mr. Van Damme is upstairs, working on a piece of embroidery in an embroidery frame. In his room, Peter is sitting before the mirror, smoothing his hair. As the scene goes on, he puts on his tie, brushes Whoa. his coat, and puts it on, Whoa. preparing himself meticulously for a visit from Ann. You heard on that his right. Where now hung some of Ann's motion picture stars. In her room, Ann too is getting dressed. She stands before the mirror in her slip, trying various ways of dressing her hair. Margot is seated on the sofa, hemming a skirt for Ann to wear. In the main room, Dussel can stand it no longer. He comes over, rapping sharply on the door of his and Aunt's bedroom. No, no, Mr. Dussel. I'm not dressed yet. Dussel walks away, furious, sitting down and burying his head in his hands. Aunt turns to Margot. How is that? How does that look? Fine. You didn't even look. Of course I did. It's fine. Margot, tell me. Am I terribly ugly? Oh, stop fishing. Fishing for compliments. No, no, tell me. Of course you're not. You've got nice eyes and a lot of animation and a little vague, aren't you? <laughs> she reaches over and takes a brassiere out of Margot's sewing basket. She holds it up to herself, studying the effect in the mirror. Outside, Mrs. Frank, feeling sorry for Dussel, comes over knocking at the girl's door. May I come in? Come in, mother. Mr. Dussel's impatient to get in here. Heavens! He takes the room for himself the entire day! Ah, oh, dear. You're not going in again tonight to see Peter? That is my intention. But you've already spent a great deal of time in there today. I was in there exactly twice! Once to get the dictionary, and then three quarters of an hour before supper. Aren't you afraid you're disturbing him? Mother, I have some intuition. Then may I ask you this much, Anne? Please don't shut the door when you go in. <sighs> you sound like Mrs. Von Don. She throws the brassiere back in Marco's sewing basket and picks up her blouse, putting it on. No, no, I, I don't mean to suggest anything wrong. I only wish that you wouldn't expose yourself to criticism, that you wouldn't give Mrs. Von Don the opportunity to be unpleasant. <laughs> Mrs. Von Don doesn't need an opportunity to be unpleasant. That's true. Everyone's on edge, worried about Mr. Crawler. This is one more thing. Reminder that Mr. Crawler has been in the hospital for ulcers. Um, ulcers can happen um, from things that you eat, but they can also be caused, I think, um, by like stress and anxiety. And so they're, they're worried about him. Meep is the only person that's currently taking care of them. I'm sorry, mother. I'm going to Peter's room. <laughs> I'm not going to let Petronella Von Don spoil our friendship. Mrs. Frank hesitates for a second, then goes out, closing the door after her. She gets a pack of playing cards and sits at the center table, playing solitaire. In Anne's room, Margot hands the finished skirt to Anne. As Anne is putting it on, Margot takes off her high-heeled shoes and stuffs paper in the toes so that Anne can wear them. Oh, why don't you two talk in the main room? It'd save a lot of trouble. 
It's hard on mother, having to listen to those remarks from Mrs. Von Dom and not say a word. Why doesn't she say a word? I think it's ridiculous to take it and take it. You don't understand mother at all, do you? She can't talk back. She's not like you. It's just not in her nature to fight back. Anyway, the only one I worry about is you. I feel awfully guilty about you. She sits on the stool near Margot, putting on Margot's high-heeled shoes. What about? I mean, every time I go into Peter's room, I have a feeling I may be hurting you. I know if it were me, I'd be wild. I'd be desperately jealous if it were me. Well, I'm not. You don't feel badly? Really? Truly? You're not jealous? Of course I'm jealous. Jealous that you've got something to get up in the morning for. But jealous of you and Peter? No. Anne um, goes back to the mirror. Maybe there's nothing to be jealous of. Maybe he doesn't really like me. Maybe I'm just taking the place of his cat. <laughs> she picks up a pair of short white gloves, putting them on. Wouldn't you like to come in with us? I have a book. The sound of the children playing outside fades out. In the main room, Dussel can stand it no longer. He jumps up, going to the bedroom door, and knocking sharply. Will you please let me in my room? Just a minute, dear, dear Mr. Dussel. She picks up her mother's pink stole and adjusts it elegantly over her shoulders, then gives a last look in the mirror. Well, here I go, to run the gauntlet. She starts out. Well, here I go, to run the gauntlet. To endure a she starts of out, followed by Margot. Thank you so much. Dussel goes into his room. Anne goes toward Peter's room, passing Mrs. Van Damme and her parents at the center table. Uh -oh. My God, look at her. Anne pays no attention. She knocks at Peter's door. I don't know what good it is to have a son. I never see him. He wouldn't care if I killed myself. Oh, my God. Peter opens the door and stands aside for Anne to come in. Just a minute, Anne. She goes to them at the door. I'd like to say a few words to my son. Do you mind? Peter and Anne stand waiting. Peter, I don't want you staying up till all hours tonight. You've got to have your sleep. You're a growing boy. You hear? Anne won't stay late. She's going to bed promptly at nine. Aren't you, Anne? Yes, mother. May we go now? Oh, are you asking me? I didn't know I had anything to say about it. Listen for the chimes, Anne, dear. The two young people go off into Peter's room, shutting the door after them. All right, so Peter's dressed up in a suit with a tie. Anne's dressed up in a newly hemmed skirt. That was Margot's, wearing Margot's shoes, has a shawl. They are truly going on a date together, but because they're stuck in the annex, they can the only privacy they can get to even like visit with each other is in one of their rooms. And Dussel won't give Anne the room or the time of day at all. So they basically have to go on dates, um, either in the main room or in Peter's room. And Mrs. Van Dan is not too keen about this. In fact, if anybody's jealous, it's Mrs. Van Dan. Meanwhile, Mrs. Frank is just worried about how it looks, um, even though, of course, nothing's happening. Um, also, remember, Peter's room is really, really, really small. So things might be kind of like cramped in there just sitting. Um, Margot, I think it was kind of cool how Anne asked Margot, you know, hey, are you jealous? But then she kept asking her, which was uh, maybe not the nicest way to do it. Um, but Margo was like, no, I'm definitely not jealous of you two. It's fine. And Anne even invited her into uh, to their date. And Margo says, no, nah, I'm good. I got a book. I'll read. All right. So uh, now um, we're going to go ahead and go to the date and hear a little bit more about what Miss Van Dan has to say about it. In my day, it was the boys who called on the girls, not the girls on the boys. You know how young people like to feel that they have secrets. Peter's room is the only place where they can talk. Talk? That's not what they called it when I was young. Yikes. Mrs. Van Damme goes off to the bathroom. Margot settles down to read her book. Mr. Frank puts his papers away 
and brings a chess game to the center table. He and Mrs. Frock start to play. In Peter's room, Anne speaks to Peter, indignant, humiliated. Aren't they awful? Aren't they impossible? Treating us as if we were still in the nursery. She sits on the cot. Peter gets a bottle of pop and two glasses. Don't let it bother you. It doesn't bother me. I suppose you can't really blame them. They think back to what they were like at our age. They don't realize how much more advanced we are. <laughs> when you think what wonderful discussions we had. Oh, I forgot. I was going to bring you some more pictures. Oh, these are fine, thanks. Don't you want some more? Meep just brought me some new ones. Maybe later. He gives her a glass of pop and, taking some for himself, sits down facing her, looking up at one of the photographs. I remember when I got that. I won it. I bet Yopi that I could eat five ice cream cones. Wow. We'd all been playing ping pong. We used to have heavenly times. We finish up with ice cream at the Delphi, or the Oasis, where Jews were allowed. There'd always be a lot of boys. We'd laugh and joke. I'd like to go back to it for a few days or a week. But after that, I know I'd be bored to death. I think more seriously about life now. I want to be a journalist, or something. I love to write. What do you want to do? I thought I might go off someplace, work on a farm or something. Some job that doesn't take much brains. You shouldn't talk that way. You've got the most awful inferiority complex. I know I'm not smart. That isn't true. You're much better than I am at dozens of things. Arithmetic and algebra and... Well, you're a million times better than I am in algebra. You like Margot, don't you? Right from the start, you liked her. Liked her much better than me. Whoa! What? Um, okay, so they're talking about uh, what they want to do when they grow up, and Anne is mid-conversation about how much smarter Peter is than her, and all of a sudden, you like Margot, don't you? Right from the start, you liked her. You liked her better than me. Okay, Anne. All right. Okay. Uh, have fun, Peter. Go ahead and answer that. Oh, I, I don't know. Awkward. In the main room, Mrs. Von Don comes from the bathroom and goes over to the sink polishing a coffee pot. It's all right. Everyone feels that way. Margot's so good. She's sweet and bright and beautiful, and I'm not. I wouldn't say that. Oh, no, I'm not. I know that. I know quite well that I'm not a beauty. I never have been and never shall be. I don't agree at all. I think you're pretty. That's not true. And another thing, you've changed. From at first, I mean. I have? I used to think you were awful noisy. And what do you think now, Peter? How have I changed? Well, uh, you're quieter <laughs> in his room. Dussel takes his pajamas and toilet articles and goes into the bathroom to change. I'm glad you don't just hate me. I never said that. I bet when you get out of here, you'll never think of me again. Well, that's crazy. When you get back with all of your friends, you're going to say, now, what did I ever see in that Mrs. Quack Quack? I haven't got any friends. Oh, Peter, of course you have. Everyone has friends. Not me. I don't want any. I get along all right without them. Does that mean you can get along without me? I think of myself as your friend. No. If they were all like you, it'd be different. Aww. He takes the glasses and the bottle and puts them away. There is a second silence. And then Aunt speaks, hesitantly, shyly. Peter, did you ever kiss a girl? Yes, once. That picture's crooked. Peter goes over, straightening the photograph. Was she pretty? Huh? The girl that you kissed. Oh my gosh, Anne. I don't know. I was blindfolded. It was at a party. One of those kissing games. Oh, I don't suppose that really counts, does it? Well, it didn't with me. I've been kissed twice. Once a man I've never seen before kissed me on the cheek when he picked me up off the ice and I was crying. And the other was Mr. Coophouse, a friend of father's who kissed my hand. You wouldn't say those counted, would you? 
I wouldn't say so. Uh, of course not, Anne. What are you? Goodness, she thinks a, a lot about this stuff. Can you tell? I know almost for certain that Margot would never kiss anyone unless she was engaged to them. And I'm sure too that Mother never touched a man before Pim. But I don't know. Things are so different now. What do you think? Do you think a girl shouldn't kiss anyone except if she's engaged or something? It's so hard to try to think what to do when here we are with the whole world falling around our ears and you think, well, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and what do you think? I suppose it'd depend on the girl. Some girls, anything they do is wrong. But others, well, it wouldn't necessarily be wrong with them. The caroline starts to strike nine o'clock. I've always thought that when two people... Nine o'clock. I have to go. <laughs> that's right. Without moving. Good night. There is a second's pause. Then Peter gets up and moves toward the door. You won't let them stop you coming? No. She rises and starts for the door. Sometime I might bring my diary. There are so many things in it that I want to talk over with you. There's a lot about you. What kind of things? Oh. I wouldn't want you to see some of it. I thought you were a nothing. Just the way you thought about me. Yikes. Did you change your mind? The way I changed my mind about you? Well, you'll see. For a second, Ann stands looking up at Peter, longing for him to kiss her. As he makes no move, she turns away. Then, suddenly, Peter grabs her awkwardly in his arms, kissing her on the cheek. Anne walks out, dazed. No. Oh. She stands for a minute, her back to the people in the main room. As she regains her poise, she goes to her mother and father and Margot, silently kissing them. They murmur their good nights to her. As she is about to open her bedroom door, she catches sight of Mrs. Van Damme. She goes quickly to her, taking her face in her hands what? and kissing her first on one cheek and then on the other. Then she hurries off into her room. Mrs. Van Don looks after her and then looks over at Peter's room. Her suspicions are confirmed. So Anne kissed her parents goodnight and Margot goodnight. And then she is about to open her bedroom door. But then she goes to Miss Van, Mrs. Van Dan. She takes her face in her hands, kisses her on one cheek and then on the other. And then she scurries off to her room. Okay, Anne. Uh, way to be obvious there, kid. She's a little flustered. Uh -huh. The lights dim out. Miss Van Dan knows the for sure. The falls on the scene. In the darkness, Anne's voice comes faintly at first. And then with growing strength. More diary entries. Here we go. By this time, we all know each other so well that if anyone starts to tell a story, the rest can finish it for him. We're having to cut down still further on our meals. What makes it worse, the rats have been at work again. They've carried off some of our precious food. Even Mr. Dussel wishes now that Mushi was here. Thursday, the 20th of April, 1944. Invasion fever is mounting every day. Neep tells us that people outside talk of nothing else. For myself, life has become much more pleasant. I often go to Peter's room after supper. Oh, don't think I'm in love, because I'm not. Okay. But it does make life more bearable to have someone with whom you can exchange views. No more tonight. P.S. I must be honest. I must confess that I actually live for the next meeting. Is there anything lovelier than to sit under the skylight and feel the sun on your cheeks and have a darling boy in your arms? Uh-huh. I there you go. I that I'm glad the Von Dons had a son and not a daughter. I've outgrown another dress. That's the third. I'm having to wear Margot's clothes after all. I'm working hard on my French and am now reading La Belle Nivernaise. As she is saying the last lines, the curtain rises on the scene. The lights dim on. As Anne's voice fades out. So things are definitely starting to change between Anne and Peter. Here we go into scene three. Scene three. It is night, a few weeks later. Everyone is in bed. There is complete quiet. 
In the Van Dan's room, a match flares up for a moment, and then is quickly put out. Mr. Van Dan, in bare feet, dressed in underwear and trousers, is dimly seen coming stealthily down the stairs and into the main room, where Mr. and Mrs. Frank and Margot are sleeping. He goes to the food safe and again lights a match. Then he cautiously opens the safe, taking out a half loaf of bread. As he closes the safe, he's at it again. He creaks. He stands rigid. Mrs. Frank sits up in bed. She sees him. Oh man! So he's been stealing food off and on, and he has finally been caught. Here we go. Otto, Otto, come schnell. Otto, Otto, calling for a husband. Come schnell. Come quickly. The rest of the people wake, hurriedly getting up. Was is los? Was is passiert? Dussel, followed by Anne, comes from his room. As she rushes over to Mr. Van Dan. Er stirbt assassin. Grabbing Mr. Van Dan. You, you, give me that. Coming down the stairs. Booty, booty, what is it? His hands on Van Dan's neck. Oh. You dirty thief, stealing food, you good for nothing. Mr. Dussel, for God's sake, help me, Peter. Peter comes over, trying with Mr. Frank to separate the two struggling men. Let him go! Let go! Dussel drops Mr. Van Dan, pushing him away. He shows them the end of a loaf of bread that he has taken from Van Dan. Mm -hmm. You greedy, selfish! Margot turns on the lights. Booty! What is it? All of Mrs. Frank's gentleness, her self-control, is gone. Oh no. She is outraged in a frenzy of indignation. Oh no. The bread. He was stealing the bread. It was you. And all the time we thought it was the rats. Mr. Van Dan, how could you? I'm hungry. We're all of us hungry. I see the children getting thinner and thinner. Your own son, Peter. I've heard him moan in his sleep. He's so hungry. And you come in the night and steal food that should go to them, to the children. He needs more food than the rest of us. He's used to more. He's a big man. Wow. So we have never seen this side of Mrs. Frank before. Um, so Mrs. Van Dan is trying to make excuses for him. He, she says, he needs more food than the rest of us. He's big. Mrs. Frank is not going to have it. So uh, let's, um, let's see where this goes. Mr. Van Dan breaks away going over and sitting on the couch. And you, you're worse than he is. You're a mother, and yet you sacrifice your child to this man, this, this. Edith, Edith. Margot picks up the pink woolen stole, putting it over her mother's shoulders. Don't think I haven't seen you. Always send me the choicest bits for him. I've watched you day after day, and I've held my tongue, but not any longer. Not after this. Now I want him to go. I want him to get out of here. Whoa! Edith, get out of here? What do you mean? Just that. Take your things and get out. You're speaking in anger. You cannot mean what you're saying. I mean exactly that. Wow. Mrs. Van Dan takes a cover from the Frank's bed, pulling it about her. For two long years we have lived here, side by side. We have respected each other's rights. We have managed to live in peace. Are we now going to throw it all away? I know this will never happen again, will it, Mr. Van Dan? No, no. He steals once, he'll steal again. Mr. Van Dan, holding his stomach, starts for the bathroom. Anne puts her arms around him, helping him up the step. Edith, please, let us be calm. We'll all go to our rooms, and afterwards, we'll sit down quietly and talk this out. We'll find some way. No. No. No more talk. I want them to leave. Whoa. You'd put us out? On the streets? There are other hiding places. A cellar. A closet. I know. And we have no money left even to pay for that. I'll give you money. Out of my own pocket, I'll give it gladly. She gets her purse from a shelf and comes back with it. Mr. Frank, 
You told Putin you'd never forget what he'd done for you when you came to Amsterdam. You said you could never repay him, that you... Counting out money. If my husband had any obligation to you, he's paid it over and over. Edith, I've never seen you like this before. I don't know you. Mrs. Frank is, or Mrs. Frank is, she's really not having it. So she's, she's got, she's raising her voice. She's saying, get out, get out. You're going to steal again. Um, and she's not listening to anybody else trying to calm her down. She's even gone into her purse and is like, here, let me give you some of my money to help get you on your way. Um, so Mrs. Frank is uh, really speaking out now, totally out of her normal character. I should have spoken out long ago. You can't be nice to some people. There would have been plenty for all of us if you hadn't come in here. Oh, no. We don't need the Nazis to destroy us. We're destroying ourselves. And on that note, that's actually where we're going to stop for our reading today. So Mr. Dussel was even saying, well, you just can't be nice to some people. And Mrs. Van Dan is now turning on Dussel, saying it's your fault that we're so short on food because you were another mouth to feed. They are all at each other's throats. And Mr. Frank's final line is, we don't need the Nazis to destroy us. We're destroying ourselves. I want you guys to think about what he's saying there and what he means by that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pick up tomorrow with, um, yeah, oh, sorry, our next day. Um, we are almost at the end of our story. All right. Bye for now, guys.